Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last day of DEF CONF US. We have another set of amazing talks lined up for you today. But first, let's start off the day with a fantastic keynote by Denise Dumas. Denise started her career in a field and role completely unrelated to tech, but quickly found herself pivoting towards the industry. After a number of years as an engineer, Denise ended up leading rel engineering at Red Hat and did so with resounding success. Denise has won three CV awards in addition to a Lifetime Achievement Award. Not satisfied with just leading engineering, Denise has recently transitioned to VP for Engineering Diversity to spearhead efforts for improving inclusion in the open source world. And let me tell you this, no one is more perfect than her for this role. I remember my first week as an intern at Red Hat where I got to meet Denise. My mind was blown by the fact that a VP who was responsible for leading the engineering efforts of the entire RHEL organization, which is at least 500 engineers, if not more, was meeting an intern who was just in her first week at Red Hat. Moreover, she was super kind and the, and the calming aura that emanated from her helped me settle in. She truly made me believe that I belonged in technology. And I know for a fact that she's had similar inspiring effects for many other engineers throughout her career. So without further ado, let's put our hands together for Denise Dumas. Take it away, Denise. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And yes, you truly do belong in technology. Blows my mind that you could even doubt it for a moment. Um, so I wanted to talk with you all today about what I've been doing for the last year. And it's, it's, really, um, it's really a topic that's dear to my heart. Open source communities have relied on talented people to volunteer their time and their energy, as well as people sponsored by companies like Red Hat. But look, look at all of you. You certainly have other things that you could be doing with your time, but here you are. And if we want open source communities to grow and thrive, we need them to attract members from the whole big, messy, diverse human pool of available talent, not just one segment of it, but how to do that. My job at Red Hat today is to be a champion for diversity in engineering. And it's a dream job for me. After a long career as a software engineer and an engineering manager. But along the way, I've received a lot of lessons about bubbles and developing empathy and diversity. And I wanted to share my continuing education with you. Putting this talk together made me realize how fortunate I was that technology, the jobs that I've had, that introduced me to people who I would never have encountered otherwise. From the very start of my career, they pushed me way outside my original insular bubble at an impressionable age. I was just lucky, but if this talk goes well, I'm gonna inspire you all to be more deliberate about expanding your bubbles. First, let's take a look at the problem space. Here are some figures around just women's open source participation. I use women as the example here because we have the most data about the participation of women globally in open source. A lot of women who want to participate decide not to because of unwelcoming behavior. How sad is that, right? And we have even less Black and Latin rep representation, um, especially in the US, than we have in women's, women's representation. Many women who want to participate decide that it's just too much hassle. They even adopt names to hide their identity. These numbers are particularly interesting to me because according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, 22.6% of professional programmers are female. But clearly, if that number is 3%, 4% for open source, 
Open source is missing a lot of opportunity. Imagine the talent and the ideas that we're not tapping into. So there are five characteristics that are generally agreed upon to define genius, curiosity, intelligence, perseverance, productivity, and most interesting to me, good luck. How can open source be the lucky break that some undiscovered genius needs? Because genius may not look exactly like what our knee-jerk reaction says. Real talent has never been in big supply, and it can be easily overlooked if it doesn't fit popular stereotypes. How can we get beyond the barriers to entry, beyond the idea that open source is not welcoming to diversity, and find the hidden talent all over the world? Let's think about humans in groups. Anthropological studies suggest that human social networks are limited in size, probably because of our neocortical volume. Our brains just aren't big enough to hold all that many connections. You've probably seen figures like this. Um, this is showing what are called Dunbar numbers. And a lot of the social networks, um, a lot of the work behind things like Facebook, it's all based on, on this kind of sociological study. The Dunbar numbers try to explain the limits of our ability to connect closely and how that expands up as connections get weaker. In your closest circle, you're probably pretty uniform. Our strongest highs are in worlds where, that we already know to people very much like ourselves who probably know many of the same people that we know. Weak ties to acquaintances, to friends of a friend, they connect us outside of our core network. They're less like us, but there are more of them. And they act as our bridges into other networks where the worldview might look totally different. Within our bubbles, we have a circle of trust. We assume good intent, right? We, we believe that the intentions of the people closest to us are not to hurt us. To live in a bubble can mean to be immersed in an environment that gets isolated from external reality. We each have our own experiences which form our own reality, but we tend to be more intimate with people who've had similar experiences. We just understand each other faster and more easily because of all that we have in common. They're in the same bubble. And you know, bubble, it's an overworked but a useful metaphor. And especially in these days of COVID, it becomes easier to see the bubbles around us, right? The bubbles are the people that you tend to meet with face to face. Looking outside of our bubble, beyond our bubble, can allow us to see things from a previously unknown perspective. Our weak ties help us create connections outside our bubbles to other bubbles that make us aware of and open up to alternative points of view. The people that we meet as acquaintances are weak ties. They're vouched for by our stronger ties, but they also connect us into other worlds if we let them. Our worlds are independent and yet connected. And when we meet others who might be very different from us, someone in a different bubble, a connection into another world, if we're open and we're curious, we can develop empathy. So why do our social circles, our bubbles matter? Travel with me now to the 1980s. Going for a run? Take your music along on this handy Walkman. You can mix your own playlist on cassette tapes. So much better than 8-track. Mobile phone? For some values of mobile. 
except that what this picture doesn't show is the backpack-sized bag of batteries that went along with this baby. Nice wired mouse on the Mac. That slot on the front, that's a floppy drive. Um, basic programming was just becoming available for the masses. Technology was strictly proprietary. Open source did not exist. It was not a thing. Linux didn't exist. <laughs> Probably most of you didn't exist. I was a very junior software engineer living in a cube farm inside a huge company. <laughs> this picture is scary. I, I bet you're all looking at this picture in horror with the visions of being trapped and bored to death and slowly morphing into a cube zombie. But appearances to the contrary Office life only looked bland. In those early days, the technology field, it was booming. And a growing field needs everybody that it can attract, right? It needs talent. And it can't afford to be too picky about the way in which the brains are packaged. Especially in these early days, stereotypes had not set in. And People decided, um, people hadn't decided that engineering was a man's job. I worked with lots of women. Um, some of them were very senior. One of them, in fact, was in charge of the whole operating system. Huh. A lot of women just like to code. We were the norm. We were hired because we displayed the aptitude and the intelligence and the skills that were needed. Um, diversity wasn't a thing either. It was a surprisingly welcoming environment, and we told our friends about it and invited them in. In 1987, 37% of the college grads with computer science majors were female. 30 years later, in the U.S., that number had dropped to like maybe 15%. But that's just the US number. In other parts of the world, like India or Romania, the numbers are much higher even now. Doesn't that make you wonder about the way that cultural stereotypes, our biases, affect our decisions about what are or are not good jobs for me? And about how different cultures have different stereotypes? I hate it when people confuse previous experience with aptitude. So although this was the 80s, the diversity mix wasn't limited to just females. I was young, I was a little slow. I worked with Don, a transgender colleague, for quite a while before I realized just how much physical change she had undergone and that our office mates once knew her as Donald. Seeing others day after day as they went through transitions. Believe me, in the 1980s, that was radical. And they were brave and sometimes a little rowdy because imagine how gutsy you need to be the first time you put on your pretty new pair of high heels and wear them into work in this office. I shared a cube for a while with Tom. Tom was a big, scary dude. He was older. He was a more senior engineer. He always wore these black leather pants with silver studs down the side. He was definitely intimidating. And his heart was broken because his partner had died of AIDS. Tears started coming down his face one day as he was sitting there next to me in the cube. We were just debugging something. And for all the tough exterior, suddenly he looked very different to me. And in fact, ever since that time, everybody in black leather pants with silver studs down sides looks different to me. So thank you. Don and Tom, 
and Dave and Hollis and all of you who opened my eyes to another reality, who shared your worldviews when I was a junior engineer because you changed me for the better. I learned to be able to see you all as individuals. The technology industry is not perfect. It was not perfect, but it's still a whole lot more accepting than anything else that I've seen. Open source has been international from the very beginning, but it was mostly the US and Western Europe English has always been the language of the internet. But even among these US and Western European nationalities, which have a lot more in common than say, I don't know, US and Congo, there are style differences that can lead to, under, to misunderstandings. My husband, who is an American, has been studying German for more than five years but even with his enormous collection of books with titles like Understanding German Culture and The German People and How to Do Business with Germans, you know, there's probably like a stack of them behind me. He still relies on his German friends to help interpret subtleties. Areas like, how do you give somebody a sincere compliment? What's acceptable behavior? How do you not offend? It's complicated. And most people try to give you credit for good intentions, even if you don't get the details quite right. But it really helps to just ask. Over 30 years of managing multinational teams, I've learned that standards differ for formality, for humor, for directness, for the amount of eye contact that feels comfortable for people, for handshaking standards, even for smiling, you know, Americans, we always smile too much, right? Um, especially for hugging, I mean, that's, that's very different. But what's funny to me is that idioms often translate across cultures. Actions speak louder than words. Pot doesn't cook rice. Mucho rido y pocas noises which literally translates as all talk and no walnuts. Different cultures have some of the same, at least fundamental ideas. Human nature is the same. It, you know, that some ideas underpin many cultures, but open source communities are seeing more and more participation from all around the world. South America, especially Brazil, from China, from Eastern Europe, from Africa, India and Pakistan, the Middle East and Israel. How do we manage to understand each other enough to work together across cultural differences that can be so profound? Here's a place where open source projects are already hitting diversity head on. And if our software is going to work around the world, we have to understand and respect local conditions. Just like my husband needs local help to understand German idiom, we all need to act as each other's trusted advisors, our windows into other cultures. Here's a sad story. A technical recruiter once confessed that he was so ashamed and afraid and embarrassed about pronouncing a job candidate's name incorrectly he just stopped bringing in people with unfamiliar names for interviews, so he'd never be in that spot again. What if we had a culture where it was just the norm to begin a relationship by asking, how do you say your name correctly? Even if the name is Bob. We set a cultural standard. You probably have some ideas by now about what my bubble was like back in the day, but here's a little more because I don't think I'm all that unusual for my demographic. I worked my way through a state college while living at home, which tells you what my family's economic situation was like. 
And at this state college, the biggest problem was finding parking. It was mostly a commuter school and everybody who attended was pretty much the same. Trying to be upwardly mobile, many of us were the first in our families to ever attend college. We had very little by way of economic safety net. And I knew that I had to work smarter unless I wanted to be a waitress all my life. And I was tired of being a waitress. I ended up in programming because it looked like a great economic opportunity. I had hated my first job out of college and I left it for a year long intensive program that taught me how to code. Aptitude, right? Not previous experience. Fortunately for me, I also fell in love with the technology. I, my career has been a joy, not a grind. I discovered something that absolutely suited me. So that was my reality. But what's your reality like? Because we're all living in bubbles that shape our worldview. You've met some of the people that enlarged my bubble. And how lucky I was, right, to land in a place where people outside my circle gave me a chance to get to know them as individuals and showed me that after all, we're all just people. Our bubbles overlapped because of our jobs and we had a chance to see each other as individuals instead of stereotypes. It was a lesson I've never forgotten and I'm sure that there was discrimination and I saw some people torment themselves trying to fit into a mold. But generally, technology was a welcoming place in the 80s for different people. But where were you going to meet someone different from you who can bridge you into another world? Maybe for you, it's an older person like me. By now, I've shared enough that you probably understand a little more about where I come from. Maybe it's a black person or someone from a different country or a different religion or any religion at all or different socioeconomic circumstances, right? Can you step out of your own shoes and try to experience the world from someone else's shoes? First, you have to develop empathy. And then you get to decide what you're gonna do with it. My joy in technology, and along with that, the ability to support yourself, that's what I wanna share today with disadvantaged kids, with poor smart kids from whatever background, every background, who are motivated to improve their lives. But what about you? How are you gonna develop empathy? And then what are you going to do with it? What can you do in your everyday life to make the world of open source a better place? Remember, talk cooks no rice. It's not about what you say. It's about what you do. Understand your biases and your bubble. Catch yourself in that split second between what you think and what you do or what you say and ask yourself what stereotype is driving that response. Maybe our reaction is knee jerk, but we get a choice about what we do with it. Choose well. Go be a mentor for outreachy or similar internships that are aimed at bringing a little more diversity into the world of open source, into great open source projects. It's a great way to meet people who are not like you. And who knows, you might find that you have a lot more in common than you think. I've met some great outreachy interns. Um, help people feel comfortable that they're not the only one in the project. Most of us are introverts who don't want to stand out in the crowd. It's a little scary to be the only one. Maybe show group pictures on your website for your project 
that includes community representatives who might be from different cultures or ages or genders or races, if they're comfortable having their picture up. Is there somebody here who looks like me? Do I have a bridge into this world? Befriend new contributors. You never know who you might meet and what you might learn from them. Provide on-ramp tasks that are suitable for newbies. Help people find them. Let them contribute and coach them on how to do it, gently. And then remember to praise somebody who contributes something useful. A lot of us aren't very confident and encouragement is valuable and really reinforcing. If you say thank you to somebody, they're more likely to come back. Remember the last time that somebody told you that they appreciated something that you had done, that your work was valuable? It just feels good. Review patches from the perspective of, does it work? And not from the perspective of, is it the way I would have written it? This insight comes from a session at the last DevConf in Brno, face to face, I missed that when several guys were discussing what patches from people with names, they were discussing the fact that patches from people with names that sound female generate a lot more trivial comments than those from people with names that sound male. And they asked themselves, why would I do that? Why am I doing that? And they realized that what they were really commenting on is that's not the way I would have written it but it still works. So thank you, Niels and company, for bringing that perspective to the issue. I think you nailed it. Lastly, call out bad behavior when you see it. We don't do that here. That establishes a really powerful cultural norm. We don't do that here. The open source community that I know best is Fedora. And I've always loved that part of the Fedora motto is friends. Freedom, friends, features first. Inclusive and innovative go together. And I want open source projects and the open source ethic to grow and thrive. In short, I want open source to be a place where a diverse mix of people, all backgrounds, all cultures, all races, all genders, all ages, want to come and stay and bring their best ideas, do their best work in open source. And if we do it right, they're going to show up, we're going to find them, and they're going to bring their friends. So thank you for listening to me and enjoy DevConf. I hope you make a lot of new friends here today. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you so much, Denise, for that. That was an amazing talk. I, I never thought about my bubble versus your bubble, um, but that was that was great. Uh, I, I would like to point out that um, I was very lucky to be surrounded by um, amazing people here who invited me to their bubble that helped me get out of my shell because I was that introvert, anxious intern, and now I'm here being a co-chair of a conference. So thank you so much for that inspiring talk. And, and I know and you look going... at the potential that we found in you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I know you're going to continue inspiring many more engineers in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Langdon now for our next segment. Or you're going to try because technology decided to fail at the best possible time. Uh, so 
I'm going to share some slides. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for that talk um, and Ravashi's uh, great intro. Um, so there's always the hunt for the, uh, the correct uh, link to uh, share. And here we go. So one of the things we like to do at DevConf US every year is we like to highlight uh, some of the uh, students, uh, you know, so in the US, if you're not an American, um, uh, <clears throat> internships are almost always in the summertime uh, with some exceptions for some universities and even some high schools. Um, but for the most part, they're almost always in the summertime. As DevConf US is always kind of right after the summertime, uh, we like to try to highlight, uh, you know, some of the work that was done um, that we, generally speaking, were involved in. That's Red Hat. Um, and so that's what this uh, bit is about. Um, and so what we have today is, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, a really large, like, kind of internship program globally. We also try to be really involved in, in uh, universities and schools and stuff in general, um, you know, and just... Uh, just kind of off the top of our head, what we are aware of is that at, uh, we teach actual classes at UMass Lowell, um, which is a, a state school um, in Massachusetts, and uh, Boston University, uh, which is a school in uh, Boston, and then Northeastern, another school in Boston. Um, and we probably actually teach at a whole bunch of other universities. Um, but it's uh, it can be a little challenging to keep track of it because as a rule, right, redheaders tend to be uh, uh, really like to give back. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if uh, if they don't see a program that they can do that with uh, internally, they just run with it. Um, so this year we had uh, kind of just in, in the kind of the Boston area, uh, 142 interns. Um, and what we are most proud of is even with the kind of COVID scenario, we, we didn't, we weren't forced to cancel a lot of internships. Um, and that was really tough. And, you know, props to all of the mentors and all of the like kind of recruiting folks and, you know, all the people involved in, you know, typical HR uh, for supporting that function. Uh, because being able to do that remotely is really challenging. And also, uh, you know, props to the students too, because like, doing an internship remotely like i i can't even imagine that's just kind of crazy um we also do uh, some other programs that are like the engineer in residence that we have over at boston university uh which is something i did um and is something we try to support so that basically we have uh, you know kind of a someone who has been in the software development world is available to students uh so that they can kind of come and ask about what it might be like to work in software development um so, and kind of moving on, sorry, we also, oh, and then, sorry, I forgot uh, one, which is we tend to also teach a lot of workshops at various levels, um, both high school and the university. Uh, specifically, I'm aware of a lot of ones by uh, the user experience folks. Uh, they do design and ideation and then even refinement workshops uh, for students who are thinking about projects that they want to do. Um, and we also try to support students at DevConf itself. So like we had a number of students um, speaking uh, yesterday and a number speaking today. Uh, so one of the things we do is we actually have an intern intern competition. Uh, so whoever gives the best lightning talk, uh, it actually gets a spot at DevConf US to, to give a talk. Um, and so you can look for them on the schedule. Um, you know, they're, they're just as... Uh, uh real as any other talk so there's not really a signifier um but uh you know definitely go check them out and here are some names of some of those speakers um and then uh a couple of other programs that we are involved in um sorry i wanted to kind of see where i am in the slides here um is uh so going kind of back a slide is the uh red hat collaboratory bu spark this is actually the program i'm a lot involved in uh we're kind of supporting students trying to do um uh things in the software world uh rather than kind of things that are uh you know academic uh although we do a lot of academic research as well um you know the parts uh, spark for example tries to look for ways for students to get more involved in software engineering um another big program that we're involved in uh and specifically actually Denise was pretty heavily involved in uh, is the Leadership Academy at another uh, Massachusetts State School UMass Amherst they're all intelligently named by the city they're in so that's obviously in Amherst um, 
And then another program that we supported um, is the RAMP program. And a lot of these you can kind of read for yourself, so I wasn't going to go into too much detail. Um, but I know uh, Denise actually uh, mentored uh, at least one or two students in this program uh, herself directly. Uh, but another, you know, and then RAMP and Source CS, all these programs, right, are trying to get um, students who are underrepresented underrepresented in the uh you know software development world uh you know kind of a, a a safer pathway uh because one of the things that we see right is that there's a lot of fall off of students they enter in computer science you know as a underrepresented group um and then they they tend to drop it after a while so something we can do to help with that is is to try to support them as uh, software engineers uh and try to help them understand what that that world is like uh without having to just wing it um you know compared to uh, somebody who's you know maybe gotten lucky and had a computer their whole life and been programming you know since they were six uh like a good friend of mine for example um so all these programs and then uh you know unfortunately because of covid uh normally we try to feature a lot of students at this um but in this particular case we are going to feature one program where we were able to negotiate with class times and that kind of stuff and actually get the students here for it uh which is the source cs program and now we're going to have uh fred martin who is the associate dean at university of Lowell or University of Massachusetts Lowell, uh, often referred to as UML. So if you hear that, that's why. Um, and it is not a uh, drawing language. Um, and so, Fred, do you want to uh, come on and, and tell us a little bit about the program? Sure. Thanks, Langton. Um, and I'm just blown away by Denise, by your talk. Um, it was really inspiring to me and to hear your personal story. I mean, made a big impact on me. Um, I'm really happy to be able to be here with you today, and, and Langton, you're going to introduce our students from UMass Lowell. Um, so two years ago, uh, we created this SOAR CS program, and, and Red Hat um, was one of our founding sponsor, is our is our founding sponsor, and you support us again this year. Um, this year, of course, we did it virtually. Um, and just building on what Denise and Langton, you both said, um, to me, this program is about giving opportunities to students um, to to advance them in computer science, support and advance them, um, and particularly diverse students. Um, so yeah, so it's a summer program. It's it's called a bridge program. That's the university parlance for a bridge between high school and university to really give um, students a, a jump start on their university careers. And um, thanks for having us here, Langton. And, and um, yeah, and, and and welcome to our students who are here. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's uh, we're really happy to have you. It's, uh, I I think this is a lot of fun. Uh, so, and I hope the audience does as well. Uh, so, to start off with, we are going to uh, this might uh, to be honest, this might be my personal favorite of the projects um, because it's near and dear to my near and dear to my heart as a public transit user when there's no COVID. Um, so, this is uh, Jalen Dones uh, and uh, the project that. Uh, she worked on over the summer. She's going to tell us a little bit about. Hello, everybody. My name is Jalen. And uh, over the summer, I got the opportunity through Sourceus to learn a lot more about web APIs. And um, so I worked on a project called Predicting Trains using Python and web APIs. Essentially, so in Massachusetts, we have the MBTA that runs commuter li commuter rail lines throughout all the neighboring cities. And I live near one of the commuter rail lines, so I'm always hearing the trains. But um, I wanted to be able to actually like predict when I would hear a train instead of having to like refer to the schedule and flip and look at the inbound trains and the outbound trains. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of, you know, flipping between tabs. Um, so I essentially use the MBTA API to pull that information from the schedule and then have it uh, predict when I would be able to hear a train based on my geographic location to the, uh, to the, to the line, to the train line. And uh, depending on whether it's an inbound or an outbound train, it also like adjusts the time given on the schedule to when I would be able to actually hear it. Um, as, uh, you know, as we've talked about a little bit before, what I want to know is when we're going to be able to predict when the train is not going to come, because that's really my pet peeve. Uh, so uh, thanks so much for that. And I really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next uh, project. 
And uh, so this is uh, Brian Montal Montalvin, sorry, um, and Arthur Rosa. Uh, and uh, they worked on a project to uh, share a bit about Lowell itself. Um, and uh, so, Arthur, do you want to go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about the project? Of course. So my name is Arthur Rosa. And during the summer, we worked on a project for um, Source CS. And this project, we wanted to learn more about Lowell as upcoming freshmen at the time. We wanted to learn about the area and how it is because I live pretty far and Lowe is a pretty big place compared to where I'm from. So I wanted to learn more about it. So in, um, in our project here, we made a website. We used some APIs for our, our map, our interactive map that we learned in Source CS, which proved quite useful. And also we used some outside knowledge that we didn't learn in Source CS, which is some web development like stuff like CSS and HTML, which I did not know anything about, but Brian here helped me a lot and we were able to get through it. So we added some fun facts. Uh, Lowell is like the fourth biggest city in Massachusetts, which is like 14.5 miles, which is gigantic compared to my 3.5 miles from where I am area. So, and also we added some beautiful pictures of Lowell and I hope I'll be able to go there someday, even though we're all virtual. I hope we can go soon. And um, it was just a great experience overall learning, and I appreciate it. All right, so because it wouldn't be a conference without some technical difficulties, uh, Brian uh, is unable to get his video working. But he is going to speak to us, I hope, if assuming we can get sound. Yes, awesome. I am. I'm here. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Montalvan. Uh, so going back to what Arthur really started with, we really started this project to kind of show our fellow Source CS members a bit more about Lowell because some of them aren't from Lowell or from around the area. So we really wanted to show them uh, what Lowell is really about. Um, and a quick fact for myself, I mean, a quick fact from Lowell is that, did you know that phone numbers were first invented in Lowell? That is something that I didn't really know and hopefully something new that you guys found out today. Um, so the website essentially has quick fun facts about Lowell. Um, it has, we use Google APIs. Recently I added in a carousel showing pictures of different areas of Lowell, just nice scenery around Lowell. Um, and most of all, it was just a fun and enjoyable project where I was able to help Arthur learn more about uh, web development, at, at least in the front end. And I think it was very helpful for the both of us. And we we're able to help our SORB CS members learn a bit more about Lowell. So yeah. That's great. That's great. Uh, I have a fun fact about Lowell that you may not know, which is uh, as a parent of kids with food allergies, um, the uh, minor league baseball team in Lowell has regular occurrence of uh, food safe uh, or allergy friendly uh, baseball games. Uh, obviously, not so much right now, being not very pandemic safe, but uh, in general. And uh, so uh, that's basically the most of the times my kids have actually seen baseball and being an American, uh, you know, baseball is kind of important, um, at least, you know, to old people like us. Um, so thanks again so much. Uh, and uh, we'll move on to our next project. Thank you. So uh, this project, uh, I think, is really cool, uh, but super scary. Um, so Isabel Pabon and uh, Minhas Chaudhary uh, put this project together. And I think, Isabella, you're going you're gonna to go first. All right, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the project? Hi, I'm Isabella Pabon. And for this project, we worked with a program called Meyer, which was actually created by UMass Lowell. And in Meyer, you use JavaScript to basically create anything you want in VR. There's tons of different functions and shapes you can play around with which was really cool for Min and I because we had never worked with JavaScript or VR or anything along those lines before. And I was very new to coding. Source CS was my first really good time working with coding. So I had a really fun time working with Meyer. We both did. So we, that's pretty much why we decided to finally go with it for our final project. And I think Min is going to talk about who did what and why we actually decided to do Nightmare Before Christmas. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bella. So we worked on The Nightmare Before Christmas because we both shared a love for the movie. So we decided to recreate one of our favorite scenes. And this turned out to be more interesting than I thought it would because how we allocated the work was while Bella worked mostly on the, the scenery and the snow and the houses and everything, I focused on the main character, Jack. 
And something we found was that while she was really confused at how I created Jack, I had no idea how she was making the sceneries look so well. So we realized that our different skill sets applied very differently to how we worked in Meyer, which is really cool. We, I think our next step would have been to add the music from the movie, because that's honestly the best part of the scene. But we were still learning how to do that as we went along. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out is uh, I, I got to say your full names, but I noticed that uh, both uh, uh, each of you called the other by short names. So, uh, you know, with Bella and Min, uh, which I thought was particularly amusing when I was stumbling over your names yesterday. Uh, so thanks so much again for uh, coming on with us. Uh, and uh, we're going to just kind of move to the thank you. Uh, and uh, so a little shout out to um, Beverly, Heidi, Fred, uh, Fuzia for helping put these slides together, helping uh, putting the legwork into actually making this happen. Um, you know, I'm just the face uh, uh, doing the talking, uh, but it was really on them for doing a lot of the work to make it happen. Uh, so now I'm going to invite our uh, co my, my co-chairs back, uh, and we're going to do uh, the announcement song for you. Um, and uh, if you don't know that reference, then I'm sorry. Um, but uh, what do we have to uh, make people aware of for today's uh, conference? Uh -huh. Let me get my notes. So today, um, again, we have a packed schedule with amazing talks and sessions and booths. Um, and again, I want to remind you that the schedule is the source of truth for the sessions. So go there find the video stream, and that should bring you to um, the room where your session is and just join at the time. Um, and we've been updating those video stream links with the pre-recorded talks if we have them. And if not, we'll be getting to uploading um, the recordings from Hopin um, as soon as we process them. Uh, we have our closing session tonight. It's at 6 p.m. 1800. 6 p.m. Eastern, and of course, we're going to have our trivia. Uh, so please don't miss that. And there might even be prizes. We're, there uh, might. I'm, I'm pretty. I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm very, very close. I'm we're very actually close. not 100 percent sure, but we think there will be. And if not, I will personally send you a prize if you win trivia. Or you, one thing you can also <laughs> do is you can choose any of the three of our voices on your home answering machine. Oh gosh. Uh, with a little. Shout out to, uh, uh, wait, wait, Tom. <laughs> any questions, any concerns, uh, to find important links, um, to find the CFP for DevConf um, CZ, go to the DevConf booth and um, enjoy your day today. Um, thank you so much, Denise. Thank you so much, um, Fred and Fousey and all of the students. Um, amazing. And I would, yeah, I would also like to mention one thing. I believe the store CS students are going to be hanging out in the, the defconf.us booth. So if you have any questions, we can t toggle that and create it like a session so you can talk with them. Um, also, we have a pretty cool networking roulette thing in Hopin where you can randomly meet other people that are at the conference right now. So check that out under the networking tab today. If you want to meet someone new, say hi to them, et cetera. Um, and the schedule that Sally mentioned is the schedule on SCED, not the schedule in Hopin. So use the schedule on SCED as the source of truth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there anything else, Langdon? So, I mean, you know, have have an awesome, awesome day, uh, you know, and really thanks so much for coming. Uh, and uh, we will see you at the closing. If we don't have enough people for trivia, it's no fun at all. Uh, and uh, between now and then, we will be coming up with the trivia questions. So we don't we don't want to give anything away. Thanks again. <laughs> we can't. So, so, yeah, observe, exactly. so observe things that are going on in the conference. And right. You win. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank we you all. Have a great day.